My name is Christy Nortes. I'm the Executive Director of Somos, the Literary Society of Taos. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the keynote address of the Big Read with Denise Chavez. We're thrilled and honored that you're here with us tonight. Somos is now in its 30th year, and we're in our third year of Big Read programming. Many of you attended the Winter and Summer Writer Series or maybe the Storytelling Festival. Some of you have been mentors in our Young Writers Mentorship Program. And some of you are just members who support Somos, and we thank you so much for your support. And if you're not a member, please consider it. Your membership really helps us to support the Taos writing community and to continue with our program, so thank you so much. And I'm just gonna switch to the Big Read now. This is the largest Big Read grant we've ever received. Uh, we've got $13,150 from the National Endowment of the Arts. We're also the only organization in New Mexico to receive this grant this year. Which is uh, a little bit sad, actually. Um, so hopefully that won't be the case next year. So the, um, the $13,150 grant comes with a one-to-one -one match, as most federal grants have. And that's been challenging for us. But we're $1,400 away from meeting that match, which is pretty remarkable in a community like Taos in November, um, after all of the granting cycles have ended for, for most folks. So um, if you have something to spare, we appreciate it. I'd like to thank our sponsors, who include the Taos Milagro Rotary, the Taos News, Taos Public Library. Thank you, Shirley. You're here. I saw you. Okay, thank you, Shirley. Um, Gizmo Productions, UNM Taos Library, People's Bank in the Taos, and many, many more supporters. They're all listed on the poster in the back. Um, we have many, many big read events uh, going on for the rest of the month uh, and extending into December. So. Get a schedule, check them out, and many opportunities to support those events. So don't forget. Very quickly, before I before I end this, I'd like for you to please silence these. Take a moment of silence for your phones. Now I'd like to introduce the coordinator of the Big Read, Amber Rodriguez. She's done an incredible job organizing these events. Uh, over 20, really, with all the schools participating over a month long, and she has taken this job on with aplomb and grace, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, she's so small. <laughs> I would also like to thank you all for coming. Uh, bienvenidos a todos y gracias por venir. Um, you know, I've learned something about myself during this little process of organizing the Big Read, and that is that I love to give away books. <laughs> it's fantastic. Is there a career to just give away books like this? Not a library, because they want them back. <laughs> but what's the, what is it? There's, I just want, I want to be able to, um, to do this all the time. It's great, I think I've found a new career. <laughs> well, the Taos uh, Big Read is in full swing now, and I hope you all have your copy of the book, and that you'll join us for um, all of the events we have scheduled. I think we have at least 12 more, uh, or 13 more in total. Um, you may have heard that, for example, that uh, Denise is going to be here again, uh, is still going to be here tomorrow morning at Moby Dickens Bookstore. She's going to be giving um, uh, some probaditas, or little samplings, little tastings of, our, of her new upcoming novel, soon to be published, correct? Um, called The King and Queen of Comezon at 10.30 at Bobby Dickens. We'll have the wonderful coffee that she made uh, for us again tomorrow and uh, some pan dulce as well. Okay. And um, also tomorrow night, please join us at Somos at 7 p.m. We're going to be having our first book discussion group at Somos as well. And that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be an informal discussion where in a more intimate setting we can sit around and talk about the book together. So I hope you'll join us there as well. Uh, both events are free, as are all big read events. So these events, and all the events this month, are the essence of what the Big Read aims to do throughout the country. And that is bring reading to the heart of the community and revitalize the role of literature in American culture to encourage Americans to read for pleasure and also for enlightenment. Reading to children
children is really so important. We talk so much about it in our community, reading to children. And it is important. And we have a wonderful book called My Life with the Wave uh, for children that's actually based on the first uh, story by Octavio Paz in this book. Uh, so I hope you'll, um, you'll check it out if you've got a child in your life between the ages of four and eight. We're giving that, as, uh, giving that away as well in the back of your interest. Um, but reading, while reading to children is, of course, important, I think adults' reading is also really important. It's something we don't talk about as much. Um, I think that, uh, for me, reading, reading for adults and reading as part of families is a big part of what makes me excited about coordinating the Big Read. Uh, the Big Read brings reading to the center of our community, not just for children, but for adults as well, for all of us. And that, that's what really gets me excited about it. And for this role, I don't think we could think of anyone in New Mexico better able to guide us than Denise Chavez. She's a renowned New Mexican performance writer, novelist, short story writer, actor, teacher, and activist. She is very involved in her extended community at the grassroots level. She is the artistic director of the uh, Border Book Festival in Las Cruces. As a founder, she's a founder of uh, Sin Fronteras, Writers Without Borders, and also uh, Casa Camino Real, Casa Camino Real, right? a bookstore, art gallery, community center in Las Cruces. She's been highly recognized as a writer, uh, as well as an activist. She received the 2003 Hispanic Heritage Foundation Award in Literature, the 2004 Governor's New Mexico Distinguishing Public Service Award, Distinguished Public Service Award, the 2004 Literature Award from the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, the 2013 Rounders Award, and many, many others. Her books, The Last of the Menu Girls and Loving Pedro Infante, are beloved in New Mexico and around the country. Her new novel, The King and Queen of Comezón, will be out shortly. So I could go on and on, probably, but in short, she's a treasure, and we're honored she's here. Would you please join me in welcoming Denise Chavez? things I would like to say, before I really say a few things. Um, it is great to be here. Um, I'm honored to see so many friends. This is the literary familia that I love so deeply. Um, John Nichols, thank you for coming. Alan, we were in place together in San Cafe. We were tortured as Brazilian um, prisoners of war. Uh, I'll never forget that. I see so many amigos, amigas. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, it, I'm deeply touched, of course, Stevito. He was there when my novel began, and uh, actually it began about 25 years ago, and I'll talk about that tomorrow. But I'm deeply honored to meet new friends. We will visit afterwards. We have a leaky coffee pot that was my sister. So if you come in the morning and if you have a 40 cup coffee pot, bring it. Does anyone have a 40 cupper? We need it and we, we can bring it. And if not, buy one for Amber. She's moved to this community. And one of the major things that you need besides a cheese grater is a 40 cupper. So if you want to give Somos a 40 cupper, give her, we need it in the morning. Another correction, um, I'm not a rounder. I am a rounder in my heart. I was given that award. Max Evans called me about a month and a half, two months ago, to say that I had been given the award as a rounder. What is a rounder? It comes from Max Evans's novel, a cowboy that goes into town and has too much fun. He shoots it up and really goes after it. Well, I did have the award for about a month and a half. But I protested uh, Susana Martinez, our governor's anti-immigration policy, and they took the word away from me. <laughs> so uh, all I can say is if you want to learn more about this, there's going to be an essay uh, in VB Price's New Mexico Mercury, which is a wonderful online sign. And I was a rounder. I'm still a rounder in my heart. Because number one, I didn't feel that it was a good political play. I'm not a, I am an activist, but I'm also a person from La Frontera. And I think it's very important when you get as many ganas as I do, and I see what happened to all of us, Alan. We didn't have ganas. We had no white hair, John. What happened? It doesn't matter. Next time I come back, I want to see 
Susan, thank you for coming, Bhavad, all of my dear Bhavadas, to see more young people here. I need to go into the high schools. I need to be with young people and to do writing workshops. So I am a rounder in my heart. I will always be a rounder. And my, my essay is called, And the Winner Is, because awards are uh, they few and far between. They don't matter. What, is, what really matters in our lives? Being together knowing who you are, where you come from. As my grandmother used to say, and I say in this essay, ¿Quién te parió? Where do you come from? Who gave you birth? If you know that, and you know where you come from, you will always be deeply rooted in a place of power. I know that I was born in Las Cruces, Nuevo Mexico, 42 miles from La Frontera. When I travel, I carry those Oregon Mountains with me. And I remember the Buddhist Gatha, which says, Mountain solid, mountain solid. I know who I am, I know where I come from, I know who my people are, are. I know que me parió. And so um, I think that is a good beginning to the short stories which I'm going to talk about. I wrote a piece and I'll refer to it from time to time. I, I'm deeply honored that Amber called me and that Christina got a hold of me, I love songs. I'd love to come back and do a writing workshop, but you know, I wish you had invited me all week instead of just two days, because I want to understand some of these stories too. There's a couple of them that <laughs> um, And let's face it, here's the, here's the dilemma on a wonderful book like this. It's a certain time period of authors in Mexico, and out of the 20 stories, there's only three by women. And what if this book had been uh, edited by a woman? Uh, it would have been a completely different book. Now, the, woman, the stories by women are problematic, too. They're very painful. And if, how many of you have read this, the collection of this book? OK, well, I'm, I'm going to be counting on you. Let me see those hands big and high, because we're going to be discussing this. And for the rest of you, remember, because the, it's an incredible kaleidoscope of story. And that is my theme tonight. First of all, I come from La Frontera. Denise Chavez, born and raised in Las Cruces, on the cross, as, as I like to think. I was driving up and looking at the Oregon Mountains the other day. It's like, damn it, why am I here? I chose to live in that place. A long time ago, when I was in my mother's womb and before, and my grandmother and my grandmother. We've just passed the other Los Puertos. I chose to live in Las Cruces, in Los Cruces. I am that cross because I have so many lessons to learn. Not only living in La Frontera, but also living in a place of extreme poverty, as we have poverty here in Nuevo Mexico a place that is compromised, depressed, and you think we have poverty, and then you read these stories. It is so profoundly moving to read these stories because you come up from a world of opulence, Mexico, La Zona Rosa. You go to, um, like my experiences in Mexico, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, but I also wanna talk about the theme, which I chose, kaleidoscope. What is a kaleidoscope? I was looking for a kaleidoscope lately. Where are they? You can't find them anymore. They're those wonderful tubes, and you move them, and you see something different, and it changes, and the forms change. It's a cylinder with mirrors containing loose colored objects. And if you've ever had a kaleidoscope, there's nothing more magical. And this is the collection of stories. I thought, what is a metaphor for these stories? A kaleidoscope, kaleidoscopio, el cuento, the story that is Mexico. You you're standing on a corner, you see a, a man with safety pins, mounded, a huge mound of safety pins. How can you make a living selling safety pins in Mexico on that corner? And he's on the corner of Bellas Artes, that incredible place with the glass curtain, and you're going to go in see, to see Ballet Folklorico, and you realize that somebody's selling safety pins so this opulence can exist. 
The bigger the front, the bigger the back. Uh, the kaleidoscope is that complex, shifting pattern of scene that is Mexico. Mexico, a place of the miraculous. Mexico, esa tierra sagrada, mi tierra natal, that's where my people come from. Como tú, Mexico, ninguno. There's no place like you, Mexico. I remember standing in a bookshelf in our bookstore in Las Cruces, and I'd like everybody to come and see us. We were in, in uh, Mesilla for nine years, but we moved about a year and a half ago. We're now on Dornillo Street. It's a type of mesquite, and um, it's a wonderful old building owned by former Supreme Court Justice Daniel Sosa, one of the founders of MALDEF, Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. It is a home that has been inhabited by Hispanos, Anglos, and most recently an African American family, Lula and Alonzo Grimes, from 1918 to 1981, the fifth African American family in Las Cruces. And they had a reunion this summer at our place, 150 Grimes is all over the place. Afro-Latino, Afro this, Afro-Indigena, Afro everybody, every single shade. And when I am in our bookstore, I know she was a very Christian woman. She used to read her Bible by the back room, Lula's room. I feel the energy of La Lulita, she's there. Her husband didn't live there very long because he was kicked in the head by a horse but this woman lived on into her 90s. And so our world there on the Camino Real, our bookstore, reflects our new reality. We don't have the turistas como antes. We're not making as much money, but our work is deeper because we are covering the Mexicano, African-American, senior citizen, and Bato Loco community of Las Cruces. It's fabulous. So what can I say about Mexico? And I want to offer a couple of images. I remember standing in front of this bookshelf in our bookstore, and I'm looking at books from Mexico, Latin America. Ay, Dios mío. But Mexico. Oh, I am so glad to be a Mexicana. You don't know how happy that makes me. And this guy is standing next to me, and we're looking at those books. Ay, ay, Dios mío. He says, oh, it's good to be a Mexicano, Mexican-American, Chicano, Latino, whatever you want us to be. <laughs> I'm everything. I go, I am too. I'm that mestizaje. I said, oh, it's good to be a Mexicana, Mexican-American, Chicana, especially in Nuevo Mexico. And he said, I said, well, I said, there might be something really good about being Greek, too. <laughs> yeah, I wish I were Greek. Greek. I remember dancing to Sorbo the Greek, and I could get in there. And he says, Italiano. <laughs> La comida, las mujeres. Well, he didn't say that, but I knew that's what he meant. <laughs> Greek, Italian, Mexicano, Español, no, nunca, no. Espanol, no. Although our roots are Espanoles, we are that mestizaje, and those of us Mexicanos, Latinos, Chicanos, have, that have been to Spain, to the dark country, know what it is. And we know why our people came to the New World. Because, as Garcia Lorca says in a wonderful essay that I recommend to everybody, and it is called Theory and Play of the Duende. Theory and Play of the Duende. He says in this essay, what is Duende? Daniel, my husband, Zelinsky back there. What is Duende? Come on up here. It's, it's not definable. Uh, this is Daniel. I want to celebrate him. Come on up. I'm not the one to ask about Duende. Yes, you are, but you've got an opinion, and I get it to introduce you. Daniel Zelinsky. Those postcards back here are his. What is Duende? Okay, it's sort of a, an essence or an energy that some people have or something has, like a good flamenco singer. You know, you, you, can, you can be really a good flamenco, but if you don't have duende, it's not going to come across. The spirit of life, passion, that spirit, that, that magical essence. So, uh, well, a good example is if you've ever seen uh, Tony Castle, the French gypsy, he uh, made a movie called uh, 
Lacho Prado, but he has another movie called Vengo about flamenco in Sevilla. And there's this scene in the movie where these gypsies are walking down the road. One of them is trying to get good cell phone reception. It's really funny. You know, it's the, all the modern, all the one scene. And all of a sudden, they all stop in their tracks. And there's this tree there. And this tree has twenty, and they know it. So that's. That's an example. An example of the when there was a contest. He talks about this in an essay. There was a contest. All the beautiful bailarinas, las españolas, and they were gorgeous. And who won the contest? Una viejita. Because of the way she raised her hand. Empezó a bailar. So duende, duende extends from España to Nuevo Mexico to los Mexicanos. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because Garcia Lorca, who I revere in my heart, said that the only people that can match those Españoles and shake their hands, we can shake hands, son los Mexicanos. They're the only people that can match that duende. And shake a hand, los mexicanos, because we have duende as well. So I, I recommend this essay, The Theory and Practice of Duende. It's incredible. I had never read it until not that long ago. What is Mexico to me? Mexico has so many images. It's that man with the mounted um, safety pins. Thank you. It's, I, I, was, I was inside Feas Artes, but I came out for the safety pins. Thank you. It's a trip that I made to Mexico with a group called Mujer a Mujer, Woman to Woman. And we, it was right after the earthquake in 86, and we stayed in a hovel in one of the poor colonias. One spigot for the entire area, and there were dead rats around it. We were in a two bedroom place with the family, and everybody worked in that house. They came out looking good, but you wondered how they did and how they survived. The young girl worked at Sanborns, and they gave us their bed. Us was a, a woman who was a, a counselor from Minnesota. She and I got the bed. There was a toilet where you get the water and you flush it down. You know those ones? Oh, God. God help me. And I stumbled in there that night, and it was like, OK, I'm ready for this. But the thing of it was, we had the bed, we stayed there. It was marching with the costureras, with the seamstresses union when I was there. It was hanging out in that colonia and eating pan dulce. It was being with that family that I stayed with. It was not going to uh, Maxime's. The night before we left, everybody went to Maxime's, this group of women. And I couldn't go because I could not spend that much money after everything that I had seen. It was too much for me. Mexico is my mother, whose jewelry I'm wearing. Delfina Rede Favor Chavez. My mother was a widow, widowed very young in her early 30s. She was vestida de luto. She was one of those traditional Mexicana, Mexican Americans that wore black for nine years until she met my father. And she studied for 13 summers in Mexico City. She, she was a student of Diego Rivera's. And she described to me one night when the lights went off and the, the, the lesson, the, the class was conducted by candlelight. And Diego had, imagine a candle underneath his ugly face, his cara de sapo. He looked like a frog. And my mother said that it was one of the most memorable evenings of her life. He was her art history teacher, and my mother would go see him paint. She knew Frida Kahlo, my sister who passed away. My sister passed away in December, Faride, and she remembered his, her nicotine-stained hands. But my mother was Mexico. My mother was Mexico to me. She was that love. She was that passion. My mother had duende. The images that I have of Mexico, of course, uh, are going to Ciudad Juarez smuggling mangoes under the car seat, uh, going to the Mercado and eating blood sausage and then eating more mangoes and smuggling more mangoes. It was dancing. For those of us that know that part of the world, anybody else been to the caverns late at night drunk with a bunch of college students? It was hanging out at the Noah Noah 
or the, or the, you know, there were so many bars that we used to, the Kentucky Club, there, it was the world of bullfights when I was growing up. That was, those were our dates in college, to go to a bullfight. I wouldn't be caught dead in a bullfight right now, but it was the spectacle, and you wonder how you grow up with cockfights, with bullfights, with all of those things that now you eschew, you just can't even go close to. But it's a, it's a consciousness that comes on to you after a while. Mexico is all of that. It's that kaleidoscope of pain, torture, love, beauty, uh, darkness. It's all the women that worked for us. My mother was a teacher. We had women that were my, I wouldn't call them sirvientas. They were ayudantes, helpers, Nimpa, Emilia, Catawan, Catatu, Dominga, Besora, so many people that helped us. And Mexico is my, is my summers too, because we used to travel with my mother. Mexico is always, to, always the vision of a place like Tijuana. Has anybody been to Tijuana lately? No, oh, it's a hellhole. I was there with the Latin Foundation, you know, those hills. Those hills of broken down cars that are coming from the United States. You know what I'm talking about? Hills and hills and rolling hills of dysfunctional broken cars. Of trees that have the sediments of dirt, uh, dirt and earth. You go around the corner and there's a house made out of tires. If you haven't been to Tijuana lately, please go. Because it is an unbelievable place. We got lost. I was sitting next to Elena Poniatowska, the Mexican the writer that should have been in this book. I don't know why she was born in France, that's why. And these are mostly, these are all Mexicanos. Elena should have been in this book because she is such a voice of Mexico. Even though she was 10 when she moved to Mexico, her father was a, a, a Polish diplomat. But she could not believe the poverty of Tijuana, and we got lost in a very poor colonia. Even the driver of this van could not believe it. We finally got to the restaurant, and he said, he was from Tijuana, Ay, por fin, finally, we're here. He didn't know where we were. I didn't know where we were, and then I could not believe it either. So that is Mexico too, that world of darkness, of light, of energy, uh, and you know, we have this philosophy of Mexicanidad, which is Nimodo. How do you describe the Nimodo philosophy? Susan, what do you say? What is Nimodo? Come on now. You have nothing you can do about it. The roof caves in, your car won't start, you can't find your dentures, the cat's in heat, everything goes wrong, the coffee pot's not working, and if it did work, the milk is curdled, you name it. The bills are all mounded up, and not only that, but they're laid. Oh, so everything is whatever. But we keep on going. Ni modo. Because there is a spirit in Mexico, not only a spirit of duende, but the spirit of hay que dar negras, seguirle. We have to go on, ni modo. No matter what happens, we're going to go with it, and any little piece of rope, any piece of alambre, we can fix anything. The women can fix vacuum cleaners. I, I, I always say, just give me an old vacuum cleaner. It's amazing what we can do with that. Fix a washer. People have a sense of ingenuity, of braveness, a sense of, hey, let's, let's approach this. Let me see what I can do. And I think that's, that inventiveness is part of the Mexican spirit. And I'm just bringing up some different uh, images because I want to talk about them, how they reflect in, these collection of short, in this collection of short stories, which is very, very interesting to me. Um, Mexicanos are not afraid of the darkness. We know how to look deeply into the dark and into the light. And then you see the magazines, Alarma, 30 people killed in Vasco. It goes up, the bus goes off the bridge and then they show the people the head, missing heads, limbs. The beggars come up to you. Senorita, por favor. And, and the beggars are not ashamed of limbs that are missing. We are very happy to show you our wounds. 
Make God no sorrow. You want to see where I got shot? Over here. Whatever. We don't cover things up. Not at all. Let me look into that darkness. And this collection of short stories is a kaleidoscope of dream, reality, magical realism, ultra-realism, and what I call invented hyperfiction. The unbelievable stories are the truest. And that is Mexico for you, too. Who will ever forget the haunting evil of the Carnival of Bullets? That story was never ending. It's, ay, Dios mío, por Dios, ya! Yeah. I cannot read any more. How many of people read the Carnival of Bullets? Okay. Uh, John, what did you think about that story? I thought Piero was really mean. <laughs> he was a mean son of a bitch. This is a story set in the Revolution. And he has so many prisoners, he has corralled them in such a way that they only have one means of escape, and what does he do? He shoots them one by one with a pistol, but he lets them run towards the wall while he's doing it. If they get over the wall, they're free, and only one person out of 300 gets over the wall. It's a harrowing story, and it's, it's one of the truest, and I believe it because this is how it was. And this story is so contemporary. I mean, this is what's happening all over the world in Latin America and our own countries. Now with Obama's policy of, you know, somebody throws a stone at you, an immigrant, somebody crossing, shoot up. Our, our border patrol people have the authority to shoot anybody that looks suspicious or throws a rock at you. And if that Fierro character were to exist right now, and he does, don't think he doesn't, he'd be teaching at the School of the Americas, the Torture Academy in Georgia, where our first gentleman worked, and where the current state uh, educate, uh, secretary of education was a visiting professor. I have trouble with that. I have trouble when our authorities teach at the School of the Americas, where we teach Latin American dictators and soldiers to torture people. No wonder I lost the Rounders Award. I have a problem with that. And so when you see a character like Fierro, Fierro, that metal, that hard metal, what a name, huh? You see that there is no mercy in a character like that. That was one of the most harrowing and one of the most powerful stories. This is a very interesting collection. Like I say, there's three women's stories. And the men's stories, they're broken up into different sections. They're all very, very Mexican, but some, of course, you like better than others, right? This story stuck in my mind. And I had to go back and read Octavio Paz's story this morning. Thank you for coming. I had to read Octavio Paz's story this morning because I wanted to give it another chance, pobrecito. He is a poet. And uh, My Life with the Wave is an interesting story, but I wanted to get it, go at it again with new eyes to see if I liked it better than the first time. And I did. There's some beautiful writing in it, and I might read a little bit about it. It's about, it's so ethereal, it talks about the relationship of men and women, but he relates to this wave that he's in love with. And it's a very interesting, how many of you have read that, My Life with the Wave? Any commentary? What do you think about that story? Amber? It was just beautiful the way you picked a wave, because it you know, seemed to symbolize to me the, the way a new relationship and all the storm of it and the excitement of it can wash over you. I mean, a wave is the perfect metaphor for a new love affair. Yes, that's right. And he's jealous of the fish that nest in the woman's breast and her groin. And sometimes the wave is very tempestuous. And she's, uh, she screams and she cries and she won't let him alone. And she bothers him. And he's haunted by this wave, very much like relationships sometimes, right? And I think that is a metaphor for, for relationship. Uh, I have my personal favorites. 
The Chuck Mall story by Carlos Fuentes is probably one of the very strongest in the collection because I love it. I love that that twist at the end. That's one thing about the, the Mexican story. Boy, they're going to twist you and jerk you around. You think you're going in a straight line? It's like getting directions in Mexico. Have you ever done that? People do not know where the place is, but they'll give you their opinion. <laughs> and not only that, but you can look at those cuadras that he and know it's five blocks instead of two, and then they'll tell you to go this way. And so, cerca de esa casita con las gallinas, it's over there by the house with the chickens, but it's not. It's the house with the dogs. But it's there's something about giving directions that brings out. Mexicanos' true essence. They're very helpful. They want to give you information, and they're very strong and loving, and the kindest, most beautiful, generous people of the world. They'll give you anything, even bad directions, because it's something. <laughs> so this, this, I love something about Chuck Mon. Uh, anybody want to comment on that story? It is. Uh, Another surreal story by Carlos Fuentes. And it's interesting to note, uh, I'll talk about Juan Rulfo a little bit too, because Juan Rulfo is one of my very favorite writers from Mexico. And his story, uh, Diles Que No Me Matan, uh, predated magical realism. Garcia Marquez said that this writing, those two books, Juan Rulfo only wrote two books, Pedro Paramo, and the field burning plane, which is El Llano Llamas. He was a photographer, and I recommend Juan Rulfo's Mexico to you. It's by Random House. It's about a $50 book. He was an incredible photographer. He was also a screenplay writer. He wrote screenplays in Hollywood and elsewhere. It's hard to believe that. But it's interesting because he, as designated by Garcia Marquez, says that he was the father of magical realism. And so I always wanted to teach a class starting with Pedro Paramo and moving on down to some of the Chicano writers because you're looking at um, Y no se lo trago la tierra. You're talking about Elena Miramontes, Under the Feet of Jesus. You're talking a lot about a Chicano writers whose, whose works started with Pedro Paramo and came down to Gabriel Garcia Marquez his town is the same as Macondo, Comala. That's the same place. It's that magical place of mystery and magic. So one fruitful fear figures very strongly with me. And this particular story that we have, Diles que no me mata, tell them not to kill me, is so haunting. It is about a man who has a, a price over his head. He killed the haciendado. The hacienda owner that would not give him, would not let his animals get water and, and took away land and was cruel, another cruel person. And so he killed him. And 35, 40 years down the road, his son has come back to him to kill him. Please don't tell him to kill me. I'm old. I'm an old man. This is a man that's been on the run, on the lamb for 35, 40 years, and he's hiding out, and he comes into town. Imagine living with that guilt, that, that, that terrible presence of death, and to realize they're at the end in this short story that actually they are going to kill him. I'd like to revisit the short story form, but I think it's very difficult. I always thought it was very easy to write a story. Uh, but I, I don't think so anymore. I really want to thank Christina from Somos, Amber Gallup. Uh, you've done incredible hard work. Somos is a wonderful organization that should win many accolades all over the world for the work that you're doing. It's incredible. Uh, it's important to keep reading. And if somebody excited you in one of these short stories, keep reading. I don't know enough about Arredondo. I don't know enough about Pitol. I need to go and really research some of these people, and I want to see their faces too. Genos Barrio, who are they? Where did they come from? Who are their people? What do they believe in? I hope that you will continue to mine the depth that is the Mexican short story, the Latin American, and also the Chicano short story. It's a rich and marvelous world, and it's been an incredible uh, evening.
Perhaps, as the Big Read says, there is no better way for two nations to learn about one another than through sharing their stories. Sun, Stone, and Shadows presents a superb collection of the finest Mexican short stories of the 20th century. Well, maybe. Uh, yes, not all. No one can read this arresting volume without experiencing the wonder and surprise of discovery. And that is what a kaleidoscope is. You turn it one way, you get one image. You turn it another way. And Jorge Hernandez said something very nice to the editor. The temples and gods of pre-Columbian Mexico are a pile of ruins, but the spirit that breathed life into them has not disappeared. Being a Mexicano, Mexicana writer, means listening to the voice of that present. And so the ancestors are always present. That presence is always present. The temples and gods of pre-Columbian Mexico are a pile of ruins, he says, but the spirit that breathed has not disappeared. Being a Mexican writer means listening to the voice of the present.